The Lost World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 6 I Was the Flail of the Lord. Lord John Roxton and I turned down Vigo Street together, and through the dingy portals of the famous aristocratic rookery. At the end of a long drab passage, my new acquaintance pushed open a door and turned on an electric switch. A number of lamps, shining through tinted shades, bathed the whole great room before us in a ruddy radiance. Standing in the doorway and glancing round me, I had a general impression of extraordinary comfort and elegance combined with an atmosphere of masculine virility. Everywhere there were mingled the luxury of the wealthy men of taste and the careless untidiness of the bachelor. Rich furs and strange iridescent mats from some oriental bazaar were scattered upon the floor. Pictures and prints, which even my unpractised eyes could recognize as being of great price and rarity, hung thick upon the walls. Sketches of boxers, of ballet girls, and of racehorses alternated with a sensuous Fragonard, a martial Girardet, and a dreamy Turner. But amid these varied ornaments there were scattered the trophies which brought back strongly to my recollection the fact that Lord John Roxton was one of the great all-round sportsmen and athletes of his day. A dark blue oar crossed with a cherry pink one above his mantelpiece spoke of the old Oxonian and Leander man, while the foils and boxing gloves above and below them were the tools of a man who had won supremacy with each. Like a dado round the room was the jutting line of splendid heavy game heads, the best of their sort from every quarter of the world, with the rare white rhinoceros of the Lado enclave drooping its supercilious lip above them all. In the centre of the rich red carpet was a black and gold Louis Quinze table, a lovely antique, now sacrilegiously desecrated, with marks of glasses and the scars of cigar stumps. On it stood a silver tray of smokables and a burnished spirit stand, from which and an adjacent siphon my silent host proceeded to charge two high glasses. Having indicated an armchair to me, and placed my refreshment near it, he handed me a long, smooth Havana. Then, seating himself opposite to me, he looked at me long and fixedly with his strange, twinkling, reckless eyes, eyes of a cold light blue, the color of a glacier lake. Through the thin haze of my cigar smoke I noted the details of a face which was already familiar to me from many photographs, the strongly curved nose, the hollow, worn cheeks the dark, ruddy hair, thin at the top, the crisp, virile moustaches, the small aggressive tuft upon his projecting chin. Something there was of Napoleon the Third, something of Don Quixote, and yet again something which was the essence of the English country gentleman, the keen, alert, open-air lover of dogs and of horses. His skin was of a rich flower-pot red from sun and wind. His eyebrows were tufted and overhanging, which gave those naturally cold eyes an almost ferocious aspect, an impression which was increased by his strong and furrowed brow. In figure he was spare, but very strongly built. Indeed, he had often proved that there were few men in England capable of such sustained exertions. His height was a little over six feet but he seemed shorter on account of a peculiar rounding of the shoulders. Such was the famous Lord John Roxton as he sat opposite to me, biting hard upon his cigar and watching me steadily in a long and embarrassing silence. "'Well,' said he at last, "'we've gone and done it, young fellow, my lad.' This curious phrase he pronounced as if it were all one word, "'Young fellow, my lad.' "'Yes, we've taken a jump, you and me, and I suppose now,' 
that when you went into that room there was no such notion in your head, what? No thought of it. The same here, no thought of it. And here we are, up to our necks in the Turin. Why, I have only been back three weeks from Uganda, and taken a place in Scotland, and signed the lease and all. Pretty goings on, what? How does it hit you? Well, it is all in the main line of my business. I am a journalist on the Gazette. Of course, you said so when you took it on. By the way, I've got a small job for you, if you'll help me. With pleasure. Don't mind taking a risk, do you? What is the risk? Well, it's Ballinger. He's the risk. You've heard of him? No. Why, young fella, where have you lived? Sir John Ballinger is the best gentleman jock in the North Country. I could hold him on the flat at my best, but over jumps he's my master. Well, it's an open secret that when he's out of training he drinks hard. Striking an average, he calls it. He got delirium on Tuesday, and has been raging like a devil ever since. His room is above this. The doctors say that it is all up with the old dear, unless some food is got into him, but as he lies in bed with a revolver on his coverlet, and swears he will put six of the best through any one that comes near him, there's been a bit of a strike among the serving men. He's a hard nail, is Jack, and a dead shot, too. But you can't leave a grand national winner to die like that, what? What do you mean to do, then? I asked. Well, my idea was that you and I could rush him. He may be dozing, and at the worst he can only wing one of us, and the other should have him. If we can get his bolster cover round his arms, and then phone up a stomach pump, we'll give the old dear the supper of his life. It was a rather desperate business to come suddenly into one's day's work. I don't think that I am a particularly brave man. I have an Irish imagination which makes the unknown and the untried more terrible than they are. On the other hand, I was brought up with a horror of cowardice, and with a terror of such a stigma. I dare say that I could throw myself over a precipice, like the Hun in the history books, if my courage to do it were questioned, and yet it would surely be pride and fear, rather than courage, which would be my inspiration. Therefore, although every nerve in my body shrank from the whisky-maddened figure which I pictured in the room above, I still answered, in as careless a voice as I could command, that I was ready to go. Some further remark of Lord Roxton's about the danger only made me irritable. "'Talking won't make it any better,' said I. "'Come on.' I rose from my chair, and he from his. Then, with a little confidential chuckle of laughter, he patted me two or three times on the chest, finally pushing me back into my chair. "'All right, Sonny, my lad, you'll do,' said he. I looked up in surprise. I saw after Jock Ballinger myself this morning. He blew a hole in the skirt of my kimono, bless his shaky old hand, but we got a jacket on him, and he's to be all right in a week. I say, young fella, I hope you don't mind. What? You see, between you and me close-tiled, I look on this South American business as a mighty serious thing, and if I have a pal with me I want a man I can bank on. So I sized you down and I'm bound to say that you came well out of it. You see, it's all up to you and me, for this old summerly man will want dry nursing from the first. By the way, are you by any chance the Malone who is expected to get his rugby cap for Ireland? A reserve, perhaps. I thought I remembered your face. Why, I was there when you got that try against Richmond, as fine a swervin' run as I saw the whole season. I never miss a rugby match if I can help it, for it is the manliest game we have left. Well, I didn't ask you in here just to talk sport. We've got to fix our business. Here are the sailings on the first page of the Times. There's a booth boat for Para next Wednesday week, and if the professor and you can work it, I think we should take it, Walt. Very good. I'll fix it with him. 
What about your outfit? My paper will see to that. Can you shoot? About average territorial standard. Good Lord, as bad as that. It's the last thing you young fellows think of learning. You all been bees without stings so far as looking after the hive goes. You'll look silly some of these days when someone comes along and sneaks the honey. But you'll need to hold your gun straight in South America, for unless our friend the professor is a madman or a liar, we may see some queer things before we get back. What gun have you? He crossed to an oaken cupboard, and as he threw it open I caught a glimpse of glistening rows of parallel barrels, like the pipes of an organ. I'll see what I can spare you out of my own battery, said he. One by one he took out a succession of beautiful rifles, opening and shutting them with a snap and a clang, and then patting them as he put them back into the rack as tenderly as a mother would fondle her children. This is a Bland's 577 Exide Express, said he. I got that big fellow with it. He glanced up at the white rhinoceros. Ten more yards, and he would have added me to his collection. On that conical bullet his one chance hangs, till the weak one's advantage fair. Hope you know your Gordon, for he's the poet of the horse and the gun and the man that handles both. Now, here's a useful tool. 470. Telescopic sight. Double ejector. Point blank up to 350. That's the rifle I used against the Peruvian slave-drivers three years ago. I was the flail of the Lord up in those parts, I may tell you, though you won't find it in any blue book. There are times, young fella, when every one of us must take a stand for human right and justice, or you never feel clean again. That's why I made a little war on my own, declared it myself, waged it myself, ended it myself. Each of those nicks is for a slave murderer. A good row of them, what? That big one is for Pedro Lopez, the king of them all, that I killed in a backwater of the Putamayo River. Now, here's something that would do for you. He took out a beautiful brown and silver rifle. Well rubbered at the stock, sharply sighted, five cartridges to the clip. You can trust your life to that. He handed it to me and closed the door of his oak cabinet. "'By the way,' he continued, coming back to his chair, "'what do you know of this Professor Challenger?' "'I never saw him till to-day.' "'Well, neither did I. It's funny we should both sail under sealed orders from a man we don't know. He seemed an uppish old bird. His brothers of science don't seem too fond of him, either.' How came you to take an interest in the affair? I told him shortly my experiences of the morning, and he listened intently. Then he drew out a map of South America and laid it on the table. I believe every single word he said to you was the truth, said he earnestly. And mind you, I have something to go on when I speak like that. South America is a place I love, and I think, if you take it right through from Darien to Fuego, it's the grandest, richest, most wonderful bit of earth upon this planet. People don't know it yet, and don't realize what it may become. I have been up and down it from end to end, and had two dry seasons in those very parts, as I told you when I spoke of the war I made on the slave dealers. Well, when I was up there, I heard some yarns of the same kind, traditions of Indians and the like, but with something behind them, no doubt. The more you knew of that country, young fella, the more you would understand that anything was possible. Anything. There are just some narrow water lanes along which folk travel, and outside that it is all darkness. Now, down here in the Mato Grande, he swept his cigar over a part of the map, or up in this corner where three countries meet, nothing would surprise me. As that chap said to-night, there were fifty thousand miles of waterway running through a forest that is very near the size of Europe. You and I could be as far away from each other as Scotland is from Constantinople, and yet each of us be in the same great Brazilian forest. Man has just made a track here and a scrape there in the maze. 
why the river rises and falls the best part of forty feet and half the country is a morass that you can't pass over why shouldn't something new and wonderful lie in such a country and why shouldn't we be the men to find it out besides he added his queer gaunt face shining with delight there's a sport and risk in every mile of it i'm like an old golf ball i've had all the white paint knocked off me long ago life can whack me about now and it can't leave a mark but a sportin risk young fella that's the salt of existence then it's worth livin again we're all gettin a deal too soft and dull and comfy give me the great wastelands and the wide spaces with a gun in my fist and something to look for that's worth findin i've tried war and steeplechasing and aeroplanes but this hunting of beasts that look like a lobster supper dream is a brand new sensation he chuckled with glee at the prospect perhaps i have dwelt too long upon this new acquaintance but he is to be my comrade for many a day and so i have tried to set him down as i first saw him with his quaint personality and his queer little tricks of speech and of thought it was only the need of getting in the account of my meeting which drew me at last from his company i left him seated amid his pink radiance oiling the lock of his favorite rifle while he still chuckled to himself at the thought of the adventures which awaited us it was very clear to me that if dangers lay before us i could not in all england have found a cooler head or braver spirit with which to share them that night wearied as i was after the wonderful happenings of the day i sat late with mcardle the news editor explaining to him the whole situation which he thought important enough to bring next morning before the notice of sir george beaumont the chief it was agreed that i should write home full accounts of my adventures in the shape of successive letters to mcardle and that these should either be edited for the gazette as they arrived or held back to be published later according to the wishes of professor challenger since we could not yet know what conditions he might attach to those directions which should guide us to the unknown land in response to a telephone inquiry we received nothing more definite than a fulmination against the press ending up with the remark that if we would notify our boat he would hand us any directions which he might think it proper to give us at the moment of starting a second question from us failed to elicit any answer at all save a plaintive bleat from his wife to the effect that her husband was in a very violent temper already and that she hoped we would do nothing to make it worse a third attempt later in the day provoked a terrific crash and a subsequent message from the central exchange that professor challenger's receiver had been shattered after that we abandoned all attempt at communication and now my patient readers i can address you directly no longer from now onwards if indeed any continuation of this narrative should ever reach you it can only be through the paper which i represent in the hands of the editor i leave this account of the events which have led up to one of the most remarkable expeditions of all time so that if i never return to england there shall be some record as to how the affair came about I am writing these last lines in the saloon of the booth liner Francisca, and they will go back by the pilot to the keeping of Mr. McArdle. Let me draw one last picture before I close the notebook, a picture which is the last memory of the old country which I bear away with me. It is a wet, foggy morning in the late spring. A thin, cold rain is falling. Three shining Mackintoshed figures are walking down the quay making for the gangplank of the great liner from which the blue peter is flying in front of them a porter pushes a trolley piled high with trunks wraps and gun cases professor summerlee a long melancholy figure walks with dragging steps and drooping head as one who is already profoundly sorry for himself lord john roxton steps briskly and his thin eager face beams forth between his hunting cap and his muffler as for myself i am glad to have got the bustling days of preparation and the pangs of leave-taking behind me and i have no doubt that i show it in my bearing suddenly just as we reach the vessel there is a shout behind us 
It is Professor Challenger, who had promised to see us off. He runs after us, a puffing, red-faced, irascible figure. "'No, thank you,' says he. "'I should much prefer not to go aboard. I have only a few words to say to you, and they can very well be said where we are. I beg you not to imagine that I am in any way indebted to you for making this journey. I would have you to understand that it is a matter of perfect indifference to me, and I refuse to entertain the most remote sense of personal obligation. Truth is truth, and nothing which you can report can affect it in any way though it may excite the emotions and allay the curiosity of a number of very ineffectual people. My directions for your instruction and guidance are in this sealed envelope. You will open it when you reach a town upon the Amazon which is called Manaus, but not until the date and hour which is marked upon the outside. Have I made myself clear? I leave the strict observance of my conditions entirely to your honor. No, Mr. Malone, I will place no restriction upon your correspondence, since the ventilation of the facts is the object of your journey. But I demand that you shall give no particulars as to your exact destination, and that nothing be actually published until your return. Good-bye, sir. You have done something to mitigate my feelings for the loathsome profession to which you unhappily belong. Good-bye, Lord John. Science is, as I understand, a sealed book to you, but you may congratulate yourself upon the hunting field which awaits you. You will, no doubt, have the opportunity of describing in the field how you brought down the rocketing dimorphodon. And good-bye to you also, Professor Summerlee. If you are still capable of self-improvement, of which I am frankly unconvinced, you will surely return to London a wiser man." So he turned upon his heel, and a minute later from the deck I could see his short, squat figure bobbing about in the distance as he made his way back to his train. Well, we are well down the channel now. There's the last bell for letters, and it's good-bye to the pilot. We'll be down hull down on the old trail from now on. God bless all we leave behind us, and send us safely back. CHAPTER Seven. Tomorrow we disappear into the unknown. I will not bore those whom this narrative may reach by an account of our luxurious voyage upon the booth liner, nor will I tell of our week's stay at Pera, save that I should wish to acknowledge the great kindness of the Pereira de Pinta Company in helping us to get together our equipment. I will also allude very briefly to our river journey up a wide, slow-moving clay-tinted stream in a steamer which was little smaller than that which had carried us across the atlantic eventually we found ourselves through the narrows of obidos and reached the town of manaos here we were rescued from the limited attractions of the local inn by mr shortman the representative of the british and brazilian trading company in his hospital fazenda we spent our time until the day when we were empowered to open the letter of instructions given to us by professor challenger before i reach the surprising events of that date i would desire to give a clearer sketch of my comrades in this enterprise and of the associates whom we had already gathered together in south america i speak freely and i leave the use of my material to your discretion mr mcardle since it is through your hands that this report must pass before it reaches the world. The scientific attainments of Professor Summerlee are too well known for me to trouble to recapitulate them. He is better equipped for a rough expedition of this sort than one would imagine at first sight. His tall, gaunt, stringy figure is insensible to fatigue, and his dry, half-sarcastic, and often wholly unsympathetic manner is uninfluenced by any change in his surroundings. Though in his sixty-sixth year I have never heard him express any dissatisfaction at the occasional hardships which we have had to encounter. I had regarded his presence as an encumbrance to the expedition, but as a matter of fact I am now well convinced that his power of endurance is as great as my own. In temper he is naturally acid and skeptical. 
From the beginning he has never concealed his belief that Professor Challenger is an absolute fraud, that we are all embarked upon an absurd wild goose chase, and that we are likely to reap nothing but disappointment and danger in South America, and corresponding ridicule in England. Such are the views which, with much passionate distortion of his thin features and wagging of his thin, goat-like beard, he poured into our ears all the way from Southampton to Manaus. Since landing from the boat he has obtained some consolation from the beauty and variety of the insect and bird life around him, for he is absolutely wholehearted in his devotion to science. He spends his days flitting through the woods with his shotgun and his butterfly net, and his evenings in mounting the many specimens he has acquired. Among his minor peculiarities are that he is careless as to his attire, unclean in his person, exceedingly absent-minded in his habits, and addicted to smoking a short briar pipe, which is seldom out of his mouth. He has been upon several scientific expeditions in his youth, he was with Robertson in Papua, and the life of the camp and the canoe is nothing fresh to him. Lord John Roxton has some points in common with Professor Summerlee, and others in which they are the very antithesis to each other. He is twenty years younger, but has something of the same spare, scraggy physique. As to his appearance, I have, as I recollect, described it in that portion of my narrative which I have left behind me in London. He is exceedingly neat and prim in his ways, dresses always with great care in white drill suits and high brown mosquito boots, and shaves at least once a day. Like most men of action, he is laconic in speech, and sinks readily into his own thoughts, but he is always quick to answer a question or join in a conversation, talking in a queer, jerky, half-humorous fashion. His knowledge of the world and very especially of South America, is surprising, and he has a wholehearted belief in the possibilities of our journey which is not to be dashed by the sneers of Professor Summerlee. He has a gentle voice and a quiet manner, but behind his twinkling blue eyes there lurks a capacity for furious wrath and implacable resolution, the more dangerous because they are held in leash. He spoke little of his own exploits in Brazil and Peru, but it was a revelation to me to find the excitement which was caused by his presence among the riverine natives, who looked upon him as their champion and protector. The exploits of the Red Chief, as they called him, had become legends among them, but the real facts, as far as I could learn them, were amazing enough. These were that Lord John had found himself some years before in that no-man's land which is formed by the half-defined frontiers between Peru, Brazil, and Colombia. In this great district the wild rubber tree flourishes and has become, as in the Congo, a curse to the natives which can only be compared to their forced labor under the Spaniards upon the old silver mines of Darien. A handful of villainous half-breeds dominated the country, armed such Indians as would support them, and turned the rest into slaves, terrorizing them with the most inhuman tortures in order to force them to gather the India rubber, which was then floated down the river to Para. Lord John Roxton expostulated on behalf of the wretched victims, and received nothing but threats and insults for his pains. He then formally declared war against Pedro Lopez, the leader of the slave-drivers, enrolled a band of runaway slaves in his service, armed them, and conducted a campaign, which ended by his killing with his own hands the notorious half-breed, and breaking down the system which he represented. No wonder that the ginger-headed man with the silky voice and the free and easy manners was now looked upon with deep interest upon the banks of the great South American river, though the feelings he inspired were naturally mixed, since the gratitude of the natives was equaled by the resentment of those who desired to exploit them. One useful result of his former experiences was that he could talk fluently in the Lingoa Geral, which is the peculiar talk, one-third Portuguese and two-thirds Indian, 
which is current all over Brazil. I have said before that Lord John Roxton was a South America maniac. He could not speak of that great country without ardor, and this ardor was infectious, for, ignorant as I was, he fixed my attention and stimulated my curiosity. How I wish I could reproduce the glamour of his discourses, that peculiar mixture of accurate knowledge and of racy imagination which gave them their fascination, until even the professor's cynical and sceptical smile would gradually vanish from his thin face as he listened. He would tell the history of the mighty river so rapidly explored, for some of the first conquerors of Peru actually crossed the entire continent upon its waters, and yet so unknown in regard to all that lay behind its ever-changing banks. "'What is there?' he would cry, pointing to the north. "'Wood and marsh and unpenetrated jungle. Who knows what it may shelter? And there to the south, a wilderness of swampy forest, where no white man has ever been. The unknown is up against us on every side. Outside the narrow lines of the rivers, what does any one know? Who will say what is possible in such a country? Why should old man Challenger not be right? At which direct defiance the stubborn sneer would reappear upon Professor Summerlee's face, and he would sit, shaking his sardonic head in unsympathetic silence, behind the cloud of his briar-root pipe. So much for the moment for my two white companions, whose characters and limitations will be further exposed, as surely as my own, as this narrative proceeds. But already we have enrolled certain retainers who may play no small part in what is to come. The first is a gigantic negro named Zambo, who is a black Hercules, as willing as any horse, and about as intelligent. Him we enlisted at Para on the recommendation of the steamship company, on whose vessels he had learned to speak a halting English. It was at Para also that we engaged Gomez and Manuel, two half-breeds from up the river, just come down with a cargo of redwood. They were swarthy fellows, bearded and fierce, as active and wiry as panthers. Both of them had spent their lives in those upper waters of the Amazon which we were about to explore and it was this recommendation which had caused Lord John to engage them. One of them, Gomez, had the further advantage that he could speak excellent English. These men were willing to act as our personal servants, to cook, to row, or to make themselves useful in any way at a payment of fifteen dollars a month. Besides these, we had engaged three Mojo Indians from Bolivia, who are the most skillful at fishing and boat work of all the river tribes. The chief of these we called Mojo, after his tribe, and the others are known as Jose and Fernando. Three white men, then, two half-breeds, one negro, and three Indians made up the personnel of the little expedition, which lay waiting for its instructions at Manaos before starting upon its singular quest. At last, after a weary week, the day had come, and the hour. I ask you to picture the shaded sitting-room on the Fazenda St. Ignacio, two miles inland from the town of Manaus. Outside lay the yellow, brassy glare of the sunshine, with the shadows of the palm-trees as black and definite as the trees themselves. The air was calm, full of the eternal hum of insects, a tropical chorus of many octaves, from the deep drone of the bee to the high, keen pipe of the mosquito. Beyond the veranda was a small cleared garden, bounded with cactus hedges and adorned with clumps of flowering shrubs, round which the great blue butterflies and the tiny hummingbirds fluttered and darted in crescents of sparkling light. Within we were seated round the cane table, on which lay a sealed envelope. Inscribed upon it, in the jagged handwriting of Professor Challenger, were the words, Instructions to Lord John Roxton and Party, to be opened at Manaus upon July 15th at twelve o'clock precisely. Lord John had placed his watch upon the table beside him. We have seven more minutes, said he. The old dear is very precise. 
Professor Summerlee gave an acid smile as he picked up the envelope in his gaunt hand. "'What can it possibly matter whether we open it now or in seven minutes?' said he. "'It is all part and parcel of the same system of quackery and nonsense, for which I regret to say that the writer is notorious.' "'Oh, come, we must play the game according to rules,' said Lord John. "'It's old man Challenger's show, and we are here by his good will, so it would be rotten bad form if we didn't follow his instructions to the letter.' "'A pretty business it is,' cried the professor bitterly. "'It struck me as preposterous in London, but I'm bound to say that it seems even more so upon closer acquaintance.' I don't know what is inside this envelope, but, unless it is something pretty definite, I shall be much tempted to take the next downriver boat and catch the Bolivia at Para. After all, I have some more responsible work in the world than to run about disproving the assertions of a lunatic. Now, Roxton, surely it is time. Time it is, said Lord John. You can blow the whistle. He took up the envelope and cut it with his penknife. From it he drew a folded sheet of paper. This he carefully opened out and flattened on the table. It was a blank sheet. He turned it over. Again it was blank. We looked at each other in a bewildered silence, which was broken by a discordant burst of derisive laughter from Professor Summerlee. "'It is an open admission!' he cried. What more do you want? The fellow is a self-confessed humbug. We have only to return home and report him as the brazen impostor that he is. Invisible ink, I suggested. I don't think, said Lord Roxton, holding the paper to the light. No, young fellow, my lad, there is no use deceiving yourself. I'll go bail for it that nothing has ever been written upon this paper. "'May I come in?' boomed a voice from the veranda. The shadow of a squat figure had stolen across the patch of sunlight. That voice! That monstrous breadth of shoulder! We sprang to our feet with a gasp of astonishment as Challenger, in a round, boyish straw hat with a colored ribbon, Challenger, with his hands in his jacket pockets and his canvas shoes daintily pointing as he walked, appeared in the open space before us. He threw back his head, and there he stood in the golden glow with all his old Assyrian luxuriance of beard, all his native insolence of drooping eyelids and intolerant eyes. "'I fear,' said he, taking out his watch, "'that I am a few minutes too late. When I gave you this envelope I must confess that I had never intended that you should open it, for it had been my fixed intention to be with you before the hour.' The unfortunate delay can be a portion between a blundering pilot and an intrusive sandbank. I fear that it has given my colleague, Professor Summerlee, occasion to blaspheme. "'I am bound to say, sir,' said Lord John, with some sternness of voice, "'that your turning up is a considerable relief to us, for our mission seemed to have come to a premature end.' Even now I can't for the life of me understand why you should have worked it in so extraordinary a manner. Instead of answering, Professor Challenger entered, shook hands with myself and Lord John, bowed with ponderous insolence to Professor Summerlee, and sank back into a basket chair, which creaked and swayed beneath his weight. "'Is all ready for your journey?' he asked. "'We can start to-morrow.' Then so you shall. You need no chart of directions now, since you will have the inestimable advantage of my own guidance. From the first I had determined that I would myself preside over your investigation. The most elaborate charts would, as you will readily admit, be a poor substitute for my own intelligence and advice. As to the small ruse which I played upon you in the matter of the envelope, it is clear that, had I told you all my intentions, I should have been forced to resist unwelcome pressure to travel out with you. "'Not from me, sir,' exclaimed Professor Summerlee heartily, "'so long as there was another ship upon the Atlantic.' Challenger waved him away with his great hairy hand. 
Your common sense will, I am sure, sustain my objection and realize it that it was better that I should direct my own movements, and appear only at the exact moment when my presence was needed. That moment has now arrived. You are in safe hands. You will not now fail to reach your destination. From henceforth I take command of this expedition, and I must ask you to complete your preparations to-night, so that we may be able to make an early start in the morning. My time is of value, and the same thing may be said, no doubt, in a lesser degree, of your own. I propose, therefore, that we push on as rapidly as possible, until I have demonstrated what you have come to see." Lord John Roxton had chartered a large steam launch, the Esmeralda, which was to carry us up the river. So far as climate goes, it was immaterial what time we chose for our expedition, as the temperature ranges from seventy-five to ninety degrees both summer and winter, with no appreciable difference in heat. In moisture, however, it is otherwise. From December to May is the period of the rains, and during this time the river slowly rises until it attains a height of nearly forty feet above its low-water mark. It floods the banks, extends in great lagoons over a monstrous waste of country, and forms a huge district, called locally the Gapo, which is for the most part too marshy for foot travel and too shallow for boating. About June the waters begin to fall, and are at their lowest in October or November. Thus our expedition was at the time of the dry season, when the great river and its tributaries were more or less in a normal condition. The current of the river is a slight one, the drop being not greater than eight inches in a mile. No stream could be more convenient for navigation, since the prevailing wind is southeast, and sailing boats may make a continuous progress to the Peruvian frontier dropping down again with the current. In our own case the excellent engines of the Esmeralda could disregard the sluggish flow of the stream, and we made as rapid progress as if we were navigating a stagnant lake. For three days we steamed northwestwards up a stream which even here, a thousand miles from its mouth, was still so enormous that from its center the two banks were mere shadows upon the distant skyline. On the fourth day after leaving Moneos we turned into a tributary which at its mouth was little smaller than the main stream. It narrowed rapidly, however, and after two more days steaming we reached an Indian village, where the professor insisted that we should land, and that the Esmeralda should be sent back to Moneos. We should soon come upon rapids, he explained, which would make its further use impossible. He added privately that we were now approaching the door of the unknown country, and that the fewer whom we took into our confidence, the better it would be. To this end, also, he made each of us give our word of honor that we would publish or say nothing which would give any exact clue as to the whereabouts of our travels, while the servants were all solemnly sworn to the same effect. It is for this reason that I am compelled to be vague in my narrative and I would warn my readers that in any map or diagram which I may give, the relation of places to each other may be correct, but the points of the compass are carefully confused, so that in no way can it be taken as an actual guide to the country. Professor Challenger's reasons for secrecy may be valid, or not, but we had no choice but to adopt them, for he was prepared to abandon the whole expedition rather than modify the conditions upon which he would guide us. It was August 2nd when we snapped our last link with the outer world by bidding farewell to the Esmeralda. Since then four days have passed, during which we have engaged two large canoes from the Indians, made of so light a material, skins over a bamboo framework, that we should be able to carry them round any obstacle. These we have loaded with all our effects, and have engaged two additional Indians to help us in the navigation. I understand that they are the very two, Ataka and Ipatu by name, who accompanied Professor Challenger upon his previous journey. They appeared to be terrified at the prospect of repeating it, but the chief has patriarchal powers in these countries, and if the bargain is good in his eyes, the clansman has little choice in the matter. 
so tomorrow we disappear into the unknown. This account I am transmitting down the river by canoe, and it may be our last word to those who are interested in our fate. I have, according to our arrangement, addressed it to you, my dear Mr. McArdle, and I leave it to your discretion to delete, alter, or do what you like with it. From the assurance of Professor Challenger's manner, and in spite of the continued skepticism of Professor Summerlee, I have no doubt that our leader will make good his statement, and that we are really on the eve of some most remarkable experiences. Chapter 8 The Outlying Pickets of the New World Our friends at home may well rejoice with us, for we are at our goal, and up to a point at least we have shown that the statement of Professor Challenger can be verified. We have not, it is true, ascended the plateau, but it lies before us, and even Professor Summerlee is in a more chastened mood. Not that he will for an instant admit that his rival could be right, but he is less persistent in his incessant objections, and has sunk for the most part into an observant silence. I must hark back, however, and continue my narrative from where I dropped it. We are sending home one of our local Indians who was injured, and I am committing this letter to his charge, with considerable doubts in my mind as to whether it will ever come to hand. When I wrote last, we were about to leave the Indian village, where we had been deposited by the Esmeralda. I have to begin my report by bad news. For the first serious personal trouble, I pass over the incessant bickerings between the professors, occurred this evening. It might have had a tragic ending. I have spoken of our English-speaking half-breed, Gomez, a fine worker and a willing fellow, but afflicted, I fancy, with the vice of curiosity, which is common enough among such men. On the last evening he seems to have hid himself near the hut in which we were discussing our plans, and being observed by our huge negro, Zambo, who is as faithful as a dog, and has the hatred which all his race bear to the half-breeds, he was dragged out and carried into our presence. Gomez whipped out his knife, however, and but for the huge strength of his captor, which enabled him to disarm him with one hand, he would certainly have stabbed him. The matter has ended in reprimands, the opponents have been compelled to shake hands, and there is every hope that all will be well. As to the feuds of the two learned men, they are continuous and bitter. It must be admitted that Challenger is provocative in the last degree, but Summerlee has an acid tongue, which makes matters worse. Last night Challenger said that he never cared to walk on the Thames embankment and look up the river, as it was always sad to see one's own eventual goal. He is convinced, of course, that he is destined for Westminster Abbey. Summerlee rejoined, however, with a sour smile, by saying that he understood that Millbank Prison had been pulled down. Challenger's conceit is too colossal to allow him to be really annoyed. He only smiled in his beard and repeated, Really, really, in the pitying tone one would use to a child. Indeed, they are children both, the one wizened and cantankerous, the other formidable and overbearing yet each with a brain which has put him in the front rank of his scientific age. Brain, character, soul. Only as one sees more of life does one understand how distinct is each. The very next day we did actually make our start upon this remarkable expedition. We found that all our possessions fitted very easily into the two canoes, and we divided our personnel, six in each, taking the obvious precaution in the interests of peace of putting one professor into each canoe. Personally, I was with Challenger, who was in a beatific humor, moving about as one in a silent ecstasy and beaming benevolence from every feature. I have had some experience of him in other moods, however, and shall be the less surprised when the thunderstorms suddenly come up amidst the sunshine. If it is impossible to be at your ease, it is equally impossible to be dull in his company, for one is always in a state of half-tremulous doubt as to what sudden turn his formidable temper may take. For two days we made our way up a good-sized river some hundreds of yards broad, 
and dark in color but transparent, so that one could usually see the bottom. The affluents of the Amazon are, half of them, of this nature, while the other half are whitish and opaque, the difference depending upon the class of country through which they have flowed. The dark indicate vegetable decay, while the others point to clayey soil. Twice we came across rapids, and in each case made a portage of half a mile or so to avoid them. The woods on either side were primeval, which are more easily penetrated than woods of the second growth, and we had no great difficulty in carrying our canoes through them. How shall I ever forget the solemn mystery of it? The height of the trees and the thickness of the boles exceeded anything which I in my town-bred life could have imagined. Shooting upwards in magnificent columns until, at an enormous distance above our heads, we could dimly discern the spot where they threw out their side branches into gothic upward curves, which coalesced to form one great matted roof of verdure, through which only an occasional golden ray of sunshine shot downwards to trace a thin, dazzling line of light amidst the majestic obscurity. As we walked noiselessly amid the thick, soft carpet of decaying vegetation, the hush fell upon our souls, which comes upon us in the twilight of the abbey, and even Professor Challenger's full-chested notes sank into a whisper. Alone I should have been ignorant of the names of these giant growths, but our men of science pointed out the cedars, the great silk cotton trees, and the redwood trees, with all that profusion of various plants which has made this continent the chief supplier to the human race of those gifts of nature which depend upon the vegetable world, while it is the most backward in those products which come from animal life. Vivid orchids and wonderful colored lichens smoldered upon the swarthy tree trunks, and where a wandering shaft of light fell full upon the golden alamanda, the scarlet star clusters of the taxonia, or the rich deep blue of Ipomea, the effect was as a dream of fairyland. In these great wastes of forest, life, which abhors darkness, struggles ever upwards to the light. Every plant, even the smaller ones, curls and writhes to the green surface, twining itself round its stronger and taller brethren in the effort. Climbing plants are monstrous and luxuriant, but others which have never been known to climb elsewhere learn the art as an escape from that somber shadow, so that the common nettle, the jasmine, and even the jacetera palm tree can be seen circling the stems of the cedars and striving to reach their crowns. Of animal life there was no movement amid the majestic vaulted aisles which stretched from us as we walked but a constant movement far above our heads told of that multitudinous world of snake and monkey, bird and sloth, which lived in the sunshine and looked down in wonder at our tiny, dark, stumbling figures in the obscure depths immeasurably below them. At dawn and at sunset the howler monkeys screamed together and the parakeets broke into shrill chatter but during the hot hours of the day only the full drone of insects, like the beat of a distant surf, filled the ear, while nothing moved amid the solemn vistas of stupendous trunks, fading away into the darkness which held us in. Once some bandy-legged lurching creature, an ant-eater or a bear, scuttled clumsily amid the shadows. It was the only sign of earth life which I saw in this great Amazonian forest and yet there were indications that even human life itself was not far from us in those mysterious recesses. On the third day out we were aware of a singular deep throbbing in the air, rhythmic and solemn, coming and going fitfully throughout the morning. The two boats were paddling within a few yards of each other when first we heard it, and our Indians remained motionless, as if they had been turned to bronze, listening intently with expressions of terror upon their faces. "'What is it, then?' I asked. "'Drums,' said Lord John carelessly. "'War drums. I have heard them before.' "'Yes, sir, war drums,' said Gomez, the half-breed. 
Wild Indians, bravos, not mansos. They watch us every mile of the way. Kill us if they can. How can they watch us? I asked, gazing into the dark, motionless void. The half-breed shrugged his broad shoulders. The Indians know. They have their own way. They watch us. They talk the drum talk to each other. Kill us if they can. By the afternoon of that day, my pocket diary shows me that it was Tuesday, August 18th, at least six or seven drums were throbbing from various points. Sometimes they beat quickly, sometimes slowly, sometimes an obvious question and answer, one far to the east breaking out in a high staccato rattle, and being followed after a pause by a deep roll from the north. There was something indescribably nerve-shaking and menacing in that constant mutter, which seemed to shape itself into the very syllables of the half-breed, endlessly repeated. We will kill you if we can. We will kill you if we can. No one ever moved in the silent woods. All the peace and soothing of quiet nature lay in that dark curtain of vegetation, but away from behind there came ever the one message from our fellow man. We will kill you if we can, said the men in the east. We will kill you if we can, said the men in the north. All day the drums rumbled and whispered, while their menace reflected itself in the faces of our colored companions. Even the hardy, swaggering half-breed seemed cowed. I learned, however, that day, once for all, that both Summerlee and Challenger possessed that highest type of bravery, the bravery of the scientific mind. Theirs was the spirit which upheld Darwin among the gauchos of the Argentine, or Wallace among the headhunters of Malaya. It is decreed by a merciful nature that the human brain cannot think of two things simultaneously, so that if it be steeped in curiosity as to science, it has no room for merely personal considerations. All day amid that incessant and mysterious menace, our two professors watched every bird upon the wing, and every shrub upon the bank, with many a sharp, wordy contention, when the snarl of Summerlee came quick upon the deep growl of Challenger, but with no more sense of danger and no reference to drum-beating Indians than if they were seated together in the smoking-room of the Royal Society's club in St. James's Street. Once only did they condescend to discuss them. Baranha or Amjuaka cannibals, said Challenger, jerking his thumb towards the reverberating wood. No doubt, sir, Summerlee answered. Like all such tribes, I shall expect to find them of polysynthetic speech and of Mongolian type. Polysynthetic, certainly said Challenger indulgently. I am not aware that any other type of language exists in this continent, and I have notes of more than a hundred. The Mongolian theory I regard with deep suspicion. I should have thought that even a limited knowledge of comparative anatomy would have helped to verify it, said Summerlee bitterly. Challenger thrust out his aggressive chin until he was all beard and hat rim. No doubt, sir, a limited knowledge would have that effect. When one's knowledge is exhaustive, one comes to other conclusions. They glared at one another in mutual defiance, while all round rose the distant whisper, We will kill you, we will kill you if we can. That night we moored our canoes with heavy stones for anchors in the center of the stream and made every precaution for a possible attack. Nothing came, however, and with the dawn we pushed upon our way, the drum beating dying out behind us. About three o'clock in the afternoon we came to a very steep rapid, more than a mile long, the very one in which Professor Challenger had suffered disaster upon his first journey. I confess that the sight of it consoled me, for it was really the first direct corroboration, slight as it was, of the truth of his story. The Indians carried first our canoes, and then our stores through the brushwood, which is very thick at this point, while we four whites, our rifles on our shoulders, 
walked between them and any danger coming from the woods. Before evening we had successfully passed the rapids and made our way some ten miles above them, where we anchored for the night. At this point I reckoned that we had come not less than a hundred miles up the tributary from the main stream. It was in the early forenoon of the next day that we made the great departure. Since dawn, Professor Challenger had been acutely uneasy, continually scanning each bank of the river. Suddenly he gave an exclamation of satisfaction, and pointed to a single tree, which projected at a peculiar angle over the side of the stream. "'What do you make of that?' he asked. "'It is surely an assai palm,' said Summerlee. "'Exactly. It was an assai palm which I took for my landmark. The secret opening is half a mile onwards, upon the other side of the river. There is no break in the trees. That is the wonder and the mystery of it. There where you see light green rushes instead of dark green undergrowth, there between the great cottonwoods, that is my private gate into the unknown. Push through, and you will understand.' It was, indeed, a wonderful place. Having reached the spot marked by a line of light green rushes, we poled out two canoes through them for some hundreds of yards, and eventually emerged into a placid and shallow stream, running clear and transparent over a sandy bottom. It may have been twenty yards across, and was banked in on each side by most luxurious vegetation. No one who had not observed that for a short distance reeds had taken the place of shrubs could possibly have guessed the existence of such a stream or dreamed of the fairyland beyond. For a fairyland it was, the most wonderful that the imagination of man could conceive. The thick vegetation met overhead, interlacing into a natural pergola, and through this tunnel of verdure in a golden twilight flowed the green, pellucid river, beautiful in itself, but marvellous from the strange tints thrown by the vivid light from above, filtered and tempered in its fall. Clear as crystal, motionless as a sheet of glass, green as the edge of an iceberg, it stretched in front of us under its leafy archway, every stroke of our paddle sending a thousand ripples across its shining surface. It was a fitting avenue to a land of wonders. All sign of the Indians had passed away, but animal life was more frequent, and the tameness of the creatures showed that they knew nothing of the hunter. Fuzzy little black velvet monkeys, with snow-white teeth and gleaming, mocking eyes, chattered at us as we passed. With a dull, heavy splash, an occasional caiman plunged in from the bank. Once a dark, clumsy tapir stared at us from a gap in the bushes, and then lumbered away through the forest. Once, too, the yellow, sinuous form of a great puma whisked amid the brushwood, and its green, baleful eyes glared hatred at us over its tawny shoulder. Bird life was abundant, especially the wading birds, stork, heron, and ibis gathering in little groups, blue and scarlet and white, upon every log which jutted from the bank, while beneath us the crystal water was alive with fish of every shape and color. For three days we made our way up this tunnel of hazy green sunshine. On the longer stretches one could hardly tell as one looked ahead where the distant green water ended and the distant green archway began. The deep peace of this strange waterway was unbroken by any signs of man. "'No Indian here. Too much afraid. Kurapuri,' said Gomez. "'Kurapuri is the spirit of the woods,' Lord John explained. "'It's a name for any kind of devil. The poor beggars believe that there is something fearsome in this direction, and therefore they avoid it.' On the third day it became evident that our journey in the canoes could not last much longer for the stream was rapidly growing more shallow. Twice in as many hours we struck upon the bottom. Finally we pulled the boats up among the brushwood and spent the night on the bank of the river. In the morning Lord John and I made our way for a couple of miles through the forest, 
keeping parallel with the stream, and as it grew ever shallower we returned and reported, what Professor Challenger had already suspected, that we had reached the highest point to which the canoes could be brought. We drew them up, therefore, and concealed them among the bushes, blazing a tree with our axes, so that we should find them again. Then we distributed the various burdens among us, guns, ammunition, food, a tent, blankets, and the rest, and, shouldering our packages, we set forth upon the more laborious stage of our journey. An unfortunate quarrel between our pepper-pots marked the outset of our new stage. Challenger had from the moment of joining us issued directions to the whole party, much to the evident discontent of Summerlee. Now, upon his assigning some duty to his fellow professor, it was only the carrying of an aneroid barometer, the matter suddenly came to a head. "'May I ask, sir,' said Summerlee, with vicious calm, "'in what capacity you take it upon yourself to issue these orders?' Challenger glared and bristled. "'I do it, Professor Summerlee, as leader of this expedition.' I am compelled to tell you, sir, that I do not recognize you in that capacity. Indeed! Challenger bowed with unwieldy sarcasm. Perhaps you would define my exact position. Yes, sir. You are a man whose veracity is upon trial, and this committee is here to try it. You walk, sir, with your judges. Dear me! said Challenger, seating himself on the side of one of the canoes. In that case you will, of course, go on your way, and I will follow at my leisure. If I am not the leader, you cannot expect me to lead. Thank heaven that there were two sane men, Lord John Roxton and myself, to prevent the petulance and folly of our learned professors from sending us back empty-handed to London. Such arguing and pleading and explaining before we could get them mollified. Then at last Summerlee, with his sneer and his pipe, would move forwards, and Challenger would come rolling and grumbling after. By some good fortune we discovered about this time that both our savants had the very poorest opinion of Dr. Illingworth of Edinburgh. Thenceforward that was our one safety and every strained situation was relieved by our introducing the name of the Scotch zoologist, when both our professors would form a temporary alliance and friendship in their detestation and abuse of this common rival. Advancing in single file along the bank of the stream, we soon found that it narrowed down to a mere brook, and finally that it lost itself in a great green morass of sponge-like mosses, into which we sank up to our knees. The place was horribly haunted by clouds of mosquitoes and every form of flying pest, so we were glad to find solid ground again and to make a circuit among the trees, which enabled us to outflank this pestilent morass, which droned like an organ in the distance, so loud was it with insect life. On the second day after leaving our canoes we found that the whole character of the country changed. Our road was persistently upwards, and as we ascended the woods became thinner, and lost their tropical luxuriance. The huge trees of the alluvial Amazonian plain gave place to the phoenix and cocoa palms, growing in scattered clumps, with thick brushwood between. In the damper hollows the Mauritia palms threw out their graceful drooping fronds. We travelled entirely by compass and once or twice there were differences of opinion between Challenger and the two Indians, when, to quote the professor's indignant words, the whole party agreed to trust the fallacious instincts of undeveloped savages rather than the highest product of modern European culture. That we were justified in doing so was shown upon the third day, when Challenger admitted that he recognized several landmarks of his former journey and in one spot we actually came upon four fire-blackened stones, which must have marked a camping-place. The road still ascended, and we crossed a rock-studded slope which took two days to traverse. The vegetation had again changed. 
and only the vegetable ivory tree remained, with a great profusion of wonderful orchids, among which I learned to recognize the rare Natonia vexillaria, and the glorious pink and scarlet blossoms of Cattleya and Odontoglossum. Occasional brooks with pebbly bottoms and fern-draped banks gurgled down the shallow gorges in the hill, and offered good camping grounds every evening on the banks of some rock-studded pool, where swarms of little blue-backed fish, about the size and shape of English trout, gave us a delicious supper. On the ninth day after leaving the canoes, having done, as I reckon, about a hundred and twenty miles, we began to emerge from the trees, which had grown smaller until they were mere shrubs. Their place was taken by an immense wilderness of bamboo, which grew so thickly that we could only penetrate it by cutting a pathway with the machetes and billhooks of the Indians. It took us a long day, traveling from seven in the morning till eight at night, with only two breaks of one hour each, to get through this obstacle. Anything more monotonous and wearying could not be imagined, for even at the most open places I could not see more than ten or twelve yards, while usually my vision was limited to the back of Lord John's cotton jacket in front of me, and to the yellow wall within a foot of me on either side. From above came one thin knife edge of sunshine, and fifteen feet over our heads one saw the tops of the reeds swaying against the deep blue sky. I do not know what kind of creatures inhabit such a thicket, but several times we heard the plunging of large, heavy animals quite close to us. From their sounds Lord John judged them to be some form of wild cattle. Just as night fell we cleared the belt of bamboos, and at once formed our camp, exhausted by the interminable day. Early next morning we were again afoot, and found that the character of the country had changed once again. Behind us was the wall of bamboo, as definite as if it marked the course of a river. In front was an open plain, sloping slightly upwards, and dotted with clumps of tree ferns, the whole curving before us until it ended in a long whale-backed ridge. This we reached about midday, only to find a shallow valley beyond, rising once again into a gentle incline, which led to a low, rounded skyline. It was here, while we crossed the first of these hills, that an incident occurred which may or may not have been important. Professor Challenger, who with the two local Indians was in the van of the party, stopped suddenly and pointed excitedly to the right. As he did so, we saw, at the distance of a mile or so, something which appeared to be a huge gray bird flap slowly up from the ground and skim smoothly off, flying very low and straight, until it was lost among the tree ferns. "'Did you see it?' cried Challenger, in exultation. "'Summerly, did you see it?' His colleague was staring at the spot where the creature had disappeared. "'What do you claim that it was?' he asked. "'To the best of my belief, a pterodactyl.' Summerlee burst into derisive laughter. "'A tear fiddlestick,' said he. "'It was a stork if ever I saw one.' Challenger was too furious to speak. He simply swung his pack upon his back and continued upon his march." Lord John came abreast of me, however, and his face was more grave than was his wont. He had his zeiss glasses in his hand. "'I focused it before it got over the trees,' said he. "'I won't undertake to say what it was, but I'll risk my reputation as a sportsman, that it wasn't any bird that ever I clapped eyes on in my life.' "'So there the matter stands. Are we really just at the edge of the unknown?' encountering the outlying pickets of this lost world of which our leader speaks? I give you the incident as it occurred, and you will know as much as I do. It stands alone, for we saw nothing more which could be called remarkable. And now, my readers, if ever I have any, I have brought you up the broad river, and through the screen of rushes, and down the green tunnel, 
and up the long slope of palm trees, and through the bamboo brake, and across the plain of tree ferns. At last our destination lay in full sight of us. When we had crossed the second ridge we saw before us an irregular, palm-studded plain, and then the line of high red cliffs which I have seen in the picture. There it lies, even as I write, and there can be no question that it is the same. At the nearest point it is about seven miles from our present camp, and it curves away, stretching as far as I can see. Challenger struts about like a prize peacock, and Summerlee is silent, but still skeptical. Another day should bring some of our doubts to an end. Meanwhile, as Jose, whose arm was pierced by a broken bamboo, insist upon returning, I send this letter back in his charge, and only hope that it may eventually come to hand. I will write again as the occasion serves. I have enclosed with this a rough chart of our journey, which may have the effect of making the account rather easier to understand. Chapter 9. Who Could Have Foreseen It? A dreadful thing has happened to us. Who could have foreseen it? I cannot foresee any end to our troubles. It may be that we are condemned to spend our whole lives in this strange, inaccessible place. I am still so confused that I can hardly think clearly of the facts of the present or of the chances for the future. To my astounded senses the one seems most terrible, and the other is black as night. No men have ever found themselves in a worse position, nor is there any use in disclosing to you our exact geographical situation and asking our friends for a relief party. Even if they could send one, our fate will in all human probability be decided long before it could arrive in South America. We are, in truth, as far from any human aid as if we were on the moon. If we are to win through, it is only our own qualities which can save us. I have as companions three remarkable men, men of great brain power and of unshaken courage. There lies our one and only hope. It is only when I look upon the untroubled faces of my comrades that I see some glimmer through the darkness. Outwardly I trust that I appear as unconcerned as they. Inwardly I am filled with apprehension. Let me give you, with as much detail as I can, the sequence of events which have led us to this catastrophe. When I finished my last letter I stated that we were within seven miles from an enormous line of ruddy cliffs which encircled, beyond all doubt, the plateau of which Professor Challenger spoke. Their height as we approached them seemed to me in some places to be greater than he had stated, running up in parts to at least a thousand feet, and they were curiously striated, in a manner which is, I believe, characteristic of basaltic upheavals. Something of the sort is to be seen in Salisbury Crags at Edinburgh, the summit showed every sign of a luxuriant vegetation, with bushes near the edge, and farther back many high trees. There was no indication of any life that we could see. That night we pitched our camp immediately under the cliff, a most wild and desolate spot. The crags above us were not merely perpendicular, but curved outwards at the top, so that ascent was out of the question. Close to us was the high, thin pinnacle of rock which I believe I mentioned earlier in this narrative. It is like a broad, rich church spire, the top of it being level with the plateau, but a great chasm gaping between. On the summit of it there grew one high tree. Both pinnacle and cliff were comparatively low, some five or six hundred feet, I should think. It was on that said Professor Challenger, pointing to this tree, that the pterodactyl was perched. I climbed halfway up the rock before I shot him. I am inclined to think that a good mountaineer like myself could ascend the rock to the top, though he would, of course, be no nearer to the plateau when he had done so. As Challenger spoke of his pterodactyl, I glanced at Professor Summerlee, and for the first time I seemed to see some signs of a dawning credulity and repentance. There was no sneer upon his thin lips, 
but on the contrary a grey, drawn look of excitement and amazement. Challenger saw it too, and reveled in the first taste of victory. "'Of course,' said he, with his clumsy and ponderous sarcasm, "'Professor Summerlee will understand that when I speak of a pterodactyl I mean a stork, only it is the kind of stork which has no feathers, a leathery skin, membranous wings, and teeth in its jaws.' He grinned and blinked and bowed until his colleague turned and walked away. In the morning, after a frugal breakfast of coffee and manioc, we had to be economical of our stores. We held a council of war as to the best method of ascending to the plateau above us. Challenger presided with a solemnity as if he were the Lord Chief Justice on the bench. Picture him seated upon a rock his absurd boyish straw hat tilted on the back of his head, his supercilious eyes dominating us from under his drooping lids, his great black beard wagging as he slowly defined our present situation and our future movements. Beneath him you might have seen the three of us, myself, sunburnt, young and vigorous after our open-air tramp, summerly, solemn but still critical, behind his eternal pipe, Lord John, as keen as a razor edge, with his supple, alert figure leaning upon his rifle, and his eager eyes fixed eagerly upon the speaker. Behind us were grouped the two swarthy half-breeds and the little knot of Indians, while in front and above us towered these huge, ruddy ribs of rock which kept us from our goal. "'I need not say,' said our leader, that on the occasion of my last visit I exhausted every means of climbing the cliff, and where I failed I do not think that any one else is likely to succeed, for I am something of a mountaineer. I had none of the appliances of a rock-climber with me, but I have taken the precaution to bring them now. With their aid I am positive I could climb that detached pinnacle to the summit, but so long as the main cliff overhangs, it is vain to attempt ascending that. I was hurried upon my last visit by the approach of the rainy season, and by the exhaustion of my supplies. These considerations limited my time, and I can only claim that I have surveyed about six miles of the cliff to the east of us, finding no possible way up. What, then, shall we now do? There seems to be only one reasonable course, said Professor Summerlee. If you have explored the east, we should travel along the base of the cliff to the west, and seek for a practicable point for our ascent. That's it, said Lord John. The odds are that this plateau is of no great size, and we shall travel round it until we either find an easy way up it, or come back to the point from which we started. I have already explained to our young friend here, said Challenger, he has a way of alluding to me as if I were a schoolchild ten years old, that it is quite impossible that there should be an easy way up anywhere, for the simple reason that if there were, the summit would not be isolated, and those conditions would not obtain which have effected so singular an interference with the general laws of survival. Yet I admit that there may very well be places where an expert human climber may reach the summit, and yet a cumbrous and heavy animal be unable to descend. It is certain that there is a point where an ascent is possible. "'How do you know that, sir?' asked Summerlee sharply. "'Because my predecessor, the American Maple White, actually made such an ascent. How otherwise could he have seen the monster which he sketched in his notebook?' "'There you reason somewhat ahead of the proved facts,' said the stubborn Summerlee. I admit your plateau, because I have seen it, but I have not as yet satisfied myself that it contains any forms of life whatever. What you admit, sir, or what you do not admit, is really of inconceivably small importance. I am glad to perceive that the plateau itself has actually obtruded itself upon your intelligence. He glanced up at it, and then, to our amazement, he sprang from his rock, and seizing Summerlee by the neck, he tilted his face into the air. "'No, sir!' he shouted, hoarse with excitement. 
Do I help you to realize that the plateau contains some animal life? I have said that a thick fringe of green overhung the edge of the cliff. Out of this there had emerged a black, glistening object. As it came slowly forth and overhung the chasm, we saw that it was a very large snake with a peculiar flat, spade-like head. It wavered and quivered above us for a minute, the morning sun gleaming upon its thick, sinuous coils. Then it slowly drew inwards and disappeared. Summerlee had been so interested that he had stood unresisting while Challenger tilted his head into the air. Now he shook his colleague off and came back to his dignity. "'I should be glad, Professor Challenger,' said he, "'if you could see your way to make any remarks which may occur to you without seizing me by the chin. Even the appearance of a very ordinary rock python does not appear to justify such a liberty.' "'But there is life upon the plateau all the same,' his colleague replied in triumph. "'And now, having demonstrated this important conclusion so that it is clear to any one, however prejudiced or obtuse, I am of opinion that we cannot do better than break up our camp and travel to westward until we find some means of ascent.' The ground at the foot of the cliff was rocky and broken, so that the going was slow and difficult. Suddenly we came, however, upon something which cheered our hearts. It was the sight of an old encampment, with several empty Chicago meat tins, a bottle labeled brandy, a broken tin opener, and a quantity of other travelers' debris. A crumpled, disintegrated newspaper revealed itself as the Chicago Democrat, though the date had been obliterated. "'Not mine,' said Challenger. It must be Maple White's. Lord John had been gazing curiously at a great tree fern which overshadowed the encampment. I say, look at this, said he. I believe it is meant for a signpost. A slip of hard wood had been nailed to the tree in such a way as to point to the westward. Most certainly a signpost, said Challenger. What else? Finding himself upon a dangerous errand, our pioneer has left this sign so that any party which follows him may know the way he has taken. Perhaps we shall come upon some other indications as we proceed. We did indeed, but they were of a terrible and most unexpected nature. Immediately beneath the cliff there grew a considerable patch of high bamboo, like that which we had traversed in our journey. Many of these stems were twenty feet high, with sharp, strong tops, so that even as they stood they made formidable spears. We were passing along the edge of this cover when my eye was caught by the gleam of something white within it. Thrusting in my head between the stems, I found myself gazing at a fleshless skull. The whole skeleton was there, but the skull had detached itself and lay some feet nearer to the open. With a few blows from the machetes of our Indians we cleared the spot, and were able to study the details of this old tragedy. Only a few shreds of clothes could still be distinguished, but there was the remains of boots upon the bony feet, and it was very clear that the dead man was a European. A gold watch by Hudson of New York, and a chain which held a stylographic pen lay among the bones. There was also a silver cigarette case with J.C. from A.E.S., upon the lid. The state of the metal seemed to show that the catastrophe had occurred no great time before. "'Who can he be?' asked Lord John. "'Poor devil! Every bone in his body seems to be broken.' "'And the bamboo grows through his smashed ribs,' said Summerlee. "'It is a fast-growing plant, but it is surely inconceivable that his body could have been here while the canes grew to be twenty feet in length.' "'As to the man's identity,' said Professor Challenger, "'I have no doubt whatever upon that point. "'As I made my way up the river, "'before I reached you at the fazenda, "'I instituted very particular inquiries about Maple White. "'At Para they knew nothing. "'Fortunately, I had a definite clue, "'for there was a particular picture in his sketchbook "'which showed him taking lunch with a certain ecclesiastic at Rosario.' 
This priest I was able to find, and though he proved a very argumentative fellow, who took it absurdly amiss that I should point out to him the corrosive effects which modern science must have upon his beliefs, he nonetheless gave me some positive information. Maple White passed Rosario four years ago, or two years before I saw his dead body. He was not alone at the time, but there was a friend, an American named James Culver, who remained in the boat and did not meet this ecclesiastic. I think, therefore, that there can be no doubt that we are now looking upon the remains of this James Culver. Nor, said Lord John, is there much doubt as to how he met his death. He has fallen or been chucked from the top, and so been impaled. How else could he have come by his broken bones, and how could he have been stuck through by these canes with their points so high above our heads? A hush came over us as we stood round these shattered remains, and realized the truth of Lord John Roxton's words. The beetling head of the cliff projected over the cane break. Undoubtedly he had fallen from above. But had he fallen? Had it been an accident? Or already ominous and terrible possibilities begin to form round that unknown land. We moved off in silence, and continued to coast round the line of cliffs, which were as even and unbroken as some of those monstrous Antarctic ice-fields which I have seen depicted, as stretching from horizon to horizon, and towering high above the mastheads of the exploring vessel. In five miles we saw no rift or break and then suddenly we perceived something which filled us with new hope. In a hollow of the rock, protected from rain, there was drawn a rough arrow in chalk, pointing still to the westwards. "'Maple white again,' said Professor Challenger. He had some presentiment that worthy footsteps would follow close behind him. "'He had chalk, then?' A box of coloured chalks was among the effects I found in his knapsack. I remember that the white one was worn to a stump. "'That is certainly good evidence,' said Summerlee. "'We can only accept his guidance and follow on to the westward.' We had proceeded some five more miles when again we saw a white arrow upon the rocks. It was at a point where the face of the cliff was for the first time split into a narrow cleft. Inside the cleft was a second guidance mark which pointed right up it with the tip somewhat elevated, as if the spot indicated were above the level of the ground. It was a solemn place, for the walls were so gigantic, and the slit of blue sky so narrow and so obscured by a double fringe of verdure, that only a dim and shadowy light penetrated to the bottom. We had had no food for many hours, and were very weary with the stony and irregular journey but our nerves were too strung to allow us to halt. We ordered the camp to be pitched, however, and leaving the Indians to arrange it, we four, with the two half-breeds, proceeded up the narrow gorge. It was not more than forty feet across at the mouth, but it rapidly closed until it ended in an acute angle, too straight and smooth for an ascent. Certainly it was not this which our pioneer had attempted to indicate. We made our way back. The whole gorge was not more than a quarter of a mile deep, and then suddenly the quick eyes of Lord John fell upon what we were seeking. High up above our heads, amid the dark shadows, there was one circle of deeper gloom. Surely it could only be the opening of a cave. The base of the cliff was heaped with loose stones at the spot, and it was not difficult to clamber up. When we reached it, all doubt was removed. Not only was it an opening into the rock, but on the side of it there was marked once again the sign of the arrow. Here was the point, and this the means by which Maple White and his ill-fated comrade had made their ascent. We were too excited to return to the camp, but must make our first exploration at once. Lord John had an electric torch in his knapsack, and this had to serve us as light. He advanced, throwing his little clear circlet of yellow radiance before him, while in single file we followed at his heels. The cave had evidently been water-worn, the sides being smooth and the floor covered with rounded stones. 
It was of such a size that a single man could just fit through by stooping. For fifty yards it ran almost straight into the rock, and then it ascended at an angle of forty-five degrees. Presently this incline became even steeper, and we found ourselves climbing upon hands and knees among loose rubble which slid from beneath us. Suddenly an exclamation broke from Lord Roxton. "'It's blocked!' said he. Clustering behind him we saw in the yellow field of light a wall of broken basalt which extended to the ceiling. "'The roof has fallen in!' In vain we dragged out some of the pieces. The only effect was that the larger ones became detached, and threatened to roll down the gradient and crush us. It was evident that the obstacle was far beyond any efforts which could be made to remove it. The road by which Maple White had ascended was no longer available. Too much cast down to speak, we stumbled down the dark tunnel and made our way back to the camp. One incident occurred, however, before we left the gorge, which is of importance in view of what came afterwards. We had gathered in a little group at the bottom of the chasm, some forty feet beneath the mouth of the cave, when a huge rock rolled suddenly downwards and shot past us with tremendous force. It was the narrowest escape for one or all of us. We could not ourselves see whence the rock had come, but our half-breed servants, who were still at the opening of the cave, said that it had flown past them, and must therefore have fallen from the summit. Looking upwards, we could see no sign of movement above us amidst the green jungle which topped the cliff. There could be little doubt, however, that the stone was aimed at us, so the incident surely pointed to humanity, and malevolent humanity, upon the plateau. We withdrew hurriedly from the chasm, our minds full of this new development and its bearing upon our plans. The situation was difficult enough before, but if the obstructions of nature were increased by the deliberate opposition of man, then our case was indeed a hopeless one. And yet as we looked up at that beautiful fringe of verdure only a few hundreds of feet above our heads, there was not one of us who could conceive the idea of returning to London until we had explored it to its depths. On discussing the situation, we determined that our best course was to continue to coast round the plateau in the hope of finding some other means of reaching the top. The line of cliffs, which had decreased considerably in height, had already begun to trend from west to north, and if we could take this as representing the arc of a circle, the whole circumference could not be very great. At the worst, then, we should be back in a few days at our starting point. We made a march that day which totaled some two and twenty miles, without any change in our prospects. I may mention that our aneroid barometer shows us that in the continual incline which we have ascended since we abandoned our canoes, we have risen to no less than three thousand feet above sea level. Hence there is a considerable change both in the temperature and in the vegetation. We have shaken off some of that horrible insect life which is the bane of tropical travel. A few palms still survive, and many tree ferns, but the Amazonian trees have all been left behind. It was pleasant to see the convolvulus, the passion flower, and the begonia, all reminding me of home, here among these inhospitable rocks. There was a red begonia just the same color as one that is kept in a pot in the window of a certain villa in Stratham, but I am drifting into private reminiscence. That night, I am still speaking of the first day of our circumnavigation of the plateau, a great experience awaited us, and one which forever set at rest any doubt which we could have had as to the wonders so near us. You will realize as you read it, my dear Mr. McArdle, and possibly for the first time that the paper has not sent me on a wild goose chase, and that there is conceivably fine copy waiting for the world whenever we have the professor's leave to make use of it. I shall not dare to publish these articles unless I can bring back my proofs to England, or I shall be hailed as the journalistic Munchausen of all time. I have no doubt that you feel the same way yourself, and that you would not care to stake the whole credit of the Gazette upon this adventure, until we can meet the chorus of criticism and skepticism 
which such articles must of necessity elicit. So this wonderful incident, which would make such a headline for the old paper, must still wait its turn in the editorial drawer. And yet it was all over in a flash, and there was no sequel to it, save in our own convictions. What occurred was this. Lord John had shot an ajouti, which is a small pig-like animal, and, half of it having been given to the Indians, we were cooking the other half upon our fire. There is a chill in the air after dark, and we had all drawn close to the blaze. The night was moonless, but there were some stars, and one could see for a little distance across the plain. Well, suddenly out of the darkness, out of the night, there swooped something with a swish like an aeroplane. The whole group of us were covered for an instant by a canopy of leathery wings, and I had a momentary vision of a long, snake-like neck, a fierce red greedy eye, and a great snapping beak, filled to my amazement with little gleaming teeth. The next instant it was gone, and so was our dinner. A huge black shadow, twenty feet across, skimmed up into the air. For an instant the monster wings blotted out the stars, and then it vanished over the brow of the cliff above us. We all sat in amazed silence round the fire, like the heroes of Virgil when the harpies came down upon them. It was Summerlee who was the first to speak. "'Professor Challenger,' said he in a solemn voice, which quavered with emotion, "'I owe you an apology. Sir, I am very much in the wrong, and I beg that you will forget what is past.' It was handsomely said, and the two men for the first time shook hands. So much we have gained by this clear vision of our first pterodactyl. It was worth a stolen supper to bring two such men together. But if prehistoric life existed upon the plateau, it was not superabundant, for we had no further glimpse of it during the next three days. During this time we traversed a barren and forbidding country, which alternated between stony desert and desolate marshes full of many wild fowl upon the north and east of the cliffs from that direction the place is really inaccessible and were it not for a hardish ledge which runs at the very base of the precipice we should have had to turn back many times we were up to our waists in the slime and blubber of an old semi-tropical swamp to make matters worse the place seemed to be a favorite breeding place of the jaracaca snake the most venomous and aggressive in South America. Again and again these horrible creatures came writhing and springing towards us across the surface of this putrid bog, and it was only by keeping our shotguns forever ready that we could feel safe from them. One funnel-shaped depression in the morass, of a livid green in color from some lichen which festered in it, will always remain as a nightmare memory in my mind. It seems to have been a special nest of these vermins, and the slopes were alive with them, all writhing in our direction, for it is a peculiarity of the Jaracaca that he will always attack man at first sight. There were too many for us to shoot, so we fairly took to our heels and ran until we were exhausted. I shall always remember as we looked back how far behind we could see the heads and necks of our horrible pursuers rising and falling amid the reeds. Jerichaca Swamp we named it in the map which we are constructing. The cliffs upon the farther side had lost their ruddy tint, being chocolate brown in color. The vegetation was more scattered among the top of them, and they had sunk to three or four hundred feet in height, but in no place did we find any point where they could be ascended. If anything, they were more impossible than at the first point where we had met them. Their absolute steepness is indicated in the photograph which I took over the stony desert. Surely, said I, as we discussed the situation, the rain must find its way down somehow. There are bound to be water channels in the rocks. Our young friend has glimpses of lucidity, said Professor Challenger, patting me upon the shoulder. The rain must go somewhere, I repeated. He keeps a firm grip upon actuality. The only drawback is that we have conclusively proved by ocular demonstration that there are no water channels down the rocks. 
"'Where, then, does it go?' I persisted. "'I think it may be fairly assumed that if it does not come outwards it must run inwards. "'Then there is a lake in the centre. "'So I should suppose. "'It is more than likely that the lake may be an old crater,' said Summerlee. "'The whole formation is, of course, highly volcanic. "'But however that may be, I should expect to find the surface of the plateau slope inwards with a considerable sheet of water in the centre, which may drain off by some subterranean channel into the marshes of the Chiricaca Swamp. "'Or evaporation might preserve an equilibrium,' remarked Challenger, and the two learned men wandered off into one of their usual scientific arguments, which were as comprehensible as Chinese to the layman. On the sixth day we completed our first circuit of the cliffs, and found ourselves back at the first camp, beside the isolated pinnacle of rock. We were a disconsolate party, for nothing could have been more minute than our investigation, and it was absolutely certain that there was no single point where the most active human being could possibly hope to scale the cliff. The place which Maple White's chalk marks had indicated as his own means of access was now entirely impassable. What were we to do now? Our stores of provisions, supplemented by our guns, were holding out well, but the day must come when they would need replenishment. In a couple of months the rains might be expected, and we should be washed out of our camp. The rock was harder than marble, and any attempt at cutting a path for so great a height was more than our time or resources would admit. No wonder that we looked gloomily at each other that night, and sought our blankets with hardly a word exchanged. I remember that as I dropped off to sleep, my last recollection was that Challenger was squatting, like a monstrous bullfrog, by the fire, his huge head in his hands, sunk apparently in the deepest thought, and entirely oblivious to the good night which I wished him. But it was a very different challenger who greeted us in the morning, a challenger with contentment and self-congratulation shining from his whole person. He faced us as we assembled for breakfast with a deprecating false modesty in his eyes, as who should say, I know that I deserve all that you can say, but I pray you to spare my blushes by not saying it. His beard bristled exultantly, his chest was thrown out, and his hand was thrust into the front of his jacket. So, in his fancy, may he see himself sometimes gracing the vacant pedestal in Trafalgar Square, and adding one more to the horrors of the London streets. "'Eureka!' he cried, his teeth shining through his beard. "'Gentlemen, you may congratulate me, and we may congratulate each other. The problem is solved. You have found a way up?' I venture to think so. And where? For answer he pointed to the spire-like pinnacle upon our right. Our faces, or mine at least, fell as we surveyed it. That it could be climbed we had our companion's assurance. But a horrible abyss lay between it and the plateau. We can never get across, I gasped. We can at least all reach the summit, said he. When we are up, I may be able to show you that the resources of an inventive mine are not yet exhausted. After breakfast we unpacked the bundle in which our leader had brought his climbing accessories. From it he took a coil of the strongest and lightest rope, a hundred and fifty feet in length, with climbing irons, clamps, and other devices. Lord John was an experienced mountaineer, and Summerlee had done some rough climbing at various times so that I was really the novice at rock-work of the party, but my strength and activity may have made up for my want of experience. It was not in reality a very stiff task, though there were moments which made my hair bristle upon my head. The first half was perfectly easy, but from there upwards it became continually steeper, until, for the last fifty feet, we were literally clinging with our fingers and toes to tiny ledges and crevices in the rock. I could not have accomplished it, nor could Summerlee, if Challenger had not gained the summit. It was extraordinary to see such activity in so unwieldy a creature. And there fixed the rope round the trunk of the considerable tree which grew there. With this as our support, 
we were soon able to scramble up the jagged wall until we found ourselves upon the small grassy platform, some twenty-five feet each way, which formed the summit. The first impression which I received when I had recovered my breath was of the extraordinary view over the country which we had traversed. The whole Brazilian plain seemed to lie beneath us, extending away and away until it ended in dim blue mists upon the farthest skyline. In the foreground was the long slope, strewn with rocks and dotted with tree ferns. Farther off in the middle distance, looking over the saddleback hill, I could just see the yellow and green mass of bamboos through which we had passed, and then, gradually, the vegetation increased until it formed a huge forest which extended as far as the eyes could reach, and for a good two thousand miles beyond. I was still drinking in this wonderful panorama when the heavy hand of the professor fell upon my shoulder. "'This way, my young friend,' said he, "'Vestigia nulla retrorsum. Never look rearwards, but always to our glorious goal.' The level of the plateau, when I turned, was exactly that on which we stood, and the green bank of bushes, with occasional trees, was so near that it was difficult to realize how inaccessible it remained. At a rough guess the gulf was forty feet across, but, so far as I could see, it might as well have been forty miles. I placed one arm round the trunk of the tree and leaned over the abyss. Far down were the small dark figures of our servants looking up at us. The wall was absolutely precipitous, as was that which faced me. "'This is indeed curious,' said the creaking voice of Professor Summerlee. I turned and found that he was examining with great interest the tree to which I clung. That smooth bark and those small ribbed leaves seemed familiar to my eyes. "'Why,' I cried, "'it's a beech!' "'Exactly,' said Summerlee. "'A fellow countryman and a far land.' "'Not only a fellow countryman, my good sir,' said Challenger, but also, if I may be allowed to enlarge your simile, an ally of the first value. This beech tree will be our saviour. By George! cried Lord John. A bridge! Exactly, my friends, a bridge. It is not for nothing that I expended an hour last night in focusing my mind upon the situation. I have some recollection of once remarking to our young friend here that G.E.C. is at his best when his back is to the wall. Last night you will admit that all our backs were to the wall. But where willpower and intellect go together, there is always a way out. A drawbridge had to be found which could be dropped across the abyss. Behold it! It was certainly a brilliant idea. The tree was a good sixty feet in height, and if it only fell the right way it would easily cross the chasm. Challenger had slung the camp axe over his shoulder when he ascended. Now he handed it to me. "'Our young friend has the thews and sinews,' said he. "'I think he will be the most useful at this task. I must beg, however, that you will kindly refrain from thinking for yourself, and that you will do exactly what you are told.' Under his direction I cut such gashes in the side of the tree as would ensure that it should fall as we desired. It had already a strong natural tilt in the direction of the plateau, so that the matter was not difficult. Finally I set to work in earnest upon the trunk, taking turn and turn with Lord John. In a little over an hour there was a loud crack. The tree swayed forward and then crashed over, burying its branches among the bushes on the farther side. The severed trunk rolled to the very edge of our platform, and for one terrible second we all thought it was over. It balanced itself, however, a few inches from the edge, and there was our bridge to the unknown. All of us, without a word, shook hands with Professor Challenger, who raised his straw hat and bowed deeply to each in turn. "'I claim the honor said he, to be the first to cross to the unknown land, a fitting subject, no doubt, for some future historical painting. He had approached the bridge when Lord John laid his hand upon his coat. My dear chap, said he, I really cannot allow it. Cannot allow it, sir? 
head went back and the beard forward. "'When it is a matter of science, don't you know, I follow your lead because you are by way of being the man of science. But it's up to you to follow me when you come into my department.' "'Your department, sir. "'We all have our professions, and soldiering is mine. "'We are, according to my ideas, invading a new country, "'which may or may not be chock-full of enemies of sorts. "'To barge blindly into it for want of a little common sense and patience "'isn't my notion of management.' "'The remonstrance was too reasonable to be disregarded. "'Challenger tossed his head and shrugged his heavy shoulders. "'Well, sir,' what do you propose for all i know there may be a tribe of cannibals waiting for lunch-time among those very bushes said lord john looking across the bridge it's better to learn wisdom before you get into a cooking pot so we will content ourselves with hoping that there is no trouble waiting for us and at the same time we will act as if there were malone and i will go down again therefore and we will fetch up the four rifles together with Gomez and the other. One man can then go across, and the rest will cover him with guns, until he sees that it is safe for the whole crowd to come along. Challenger sat down upon the cut stump and groaned his impatience, but Summerlee and I were of one mind that Lord John was our leader when such practical details were in question. The climb was more a simple thing now that the rope dangled down the face of the worst part of the ascent. Within an hour we had brought up the rifles and a shotgun. The half-breeds had ascended also, and under Lord John's orders they had carried up a bale of provisions in case our first exploration should be a long one. We each had bandoliers of cartridges. "'Now, Challenger, if you really insist upon being the first man in,' said Lord John, when every preparation was complete. "'I am much indebted to you for your gracious permission,' said the angry professor." for never was a man so intolerant of every form of authority. Since you are good enough to allow it, I shall most certainly take it upon myself to act as pioneer upon this occasion. Seating himself with a leg overhanging the abyss on each side, and his hatchet slung upon his back, Challenger hopped his way across the trunk, and was soon at the other side. He clambered up and waved his arms in the air. "'At last!' he cried. "'At last!' I gazed anxiously at him, with a vague expectation that some terrible fate would dart at him from the curtain of green behind him. But all was quiet, save that a strange, many-coloured bird flew up from under his feet and vanished among the trees. Summerlee was the second. His wiry energy is wonderful in so frail a frame. He insisted upon having two rifles slung upon his back, so that both professors were armed when he had made his transit. I came next, and tried hard not to look down into the horrible gulf over which I was passing. Summerlee held out the butt-end of his rifle, and an instant later I was able to grasp his hand. As to Lord John, he walked across, actually walked without support. He must have nerves of iron. And there we were, the four of us, upon the dreamland, the lost world, of Maple White. To all of us it seemed the moment of our supreme triumph. Who could have guessed that it was the prelude to our supreme disaster? Let me say in a few words how the crushing blow fell upon us. We had turned away from the edge, and had penetrated about fifty yards of close brushwood, when there came a frightful rending crash from behind us. With one impulse we rushed back the way that we had come. The bridge was gone. Far down at the base of the cliff I saw, as I looked over, a tangled mass of branches and splintered trunk. It was our beech tree. Had the edge of the platform crumbled and let it through? For a moment this explanation was in all our minds. The next, from the farther side of the rocky pinnacle before us, a swarthy face, the face of Gomez the half-breed, was slowly protruded. Yes, it was Gomez, but no longer the Gomez of the demure smile and the mask-like expression. Here was a face with flashing eyes and distorted features, a face convulsed with hatred and with the mad joy of gratified revenge. "'Lord Roxton!' he shouted. "'Lord John Roxton!' "'Well,' said our companion, "'here I am.' 
A shriek of laughter came across the abyss. "'Yes, there you are, you English dog, and there you will remain. I have waited and waited, and now it has come my chance. You found it hard to get up, you will find it harder to get down. You cursed fools, you are trapped, every one of you.' We were too astounded to speak. We could only stand there staring in amazement. A great broken bow upon the grass showed where he had gained his leverage to tilt over our bridge. The face had vanished, but presently it was up again, more frantic than before. "'We nearly killed you with a stone at the cave,' he cried. "'But this is better. It is slower and more terrible. Your bones will whiten up there, and none will know where you lie or come to cover them. As you lie dying, think of Lopez, whom you shot five years ago on the Putameo River. I am his brother, and come what will I will die happy now, for his memory has been avenged. A furious hand was shaken at us, and then all was quiet. Had the half-breed simply wrought his vengeance and then escaped, all might have been well with him. It was that foolish, irresistible Latin impulse to be dramatic which brought his own downfall. Roxton, the man who had earned himself the name of the Flail of the Lord through three countries, was not one who could be safely taunted. The half-breed was descending on the farther side of the pinnacle, but before he could reach the ground Lord John had run along the edge of the plateau, and gained a point from which he could see his man. There was a single crack of his rifle, and though we saw nothing, we heard the scream, and then the distant thud of the falling body. Roxton came back to us with a face of granite. "'I have been a blind simpleton,' said he bitterly. "'It's my folly that has brought you all into this trouble. I should have remembered that these people have long memories for blood feuds, and have been more upon my guard. "'What about the other one? It took two of them to lever that tree over the edge.' "'I could have shot him, but I let him go. He may have had no part in it, Perhaps it would have been better if I had killed him, for he must, as you say, have lent a hand. Now that we had the clue to his action, each of us could cast back and remember some sinister act upon the part of the half-breed, his constant desire to know our plans, his arrest outside our tent when he was overhearing them, the furtive looks of hatred which from time to time one or the other of us had surprised. We were still discussing it, endeavouring to adjust our minds to these new conditions, when a singular scene in the plain below arrested our attention. A man in white clothes, who could only be the surviving half-breed, was running as one does when death is the pacemaker. Behind him, only a few yards in his rear, bounded the huge ebony figure of Zambo, our devoted negro. Even as we looked, he sprang upon the back of the fugitive and flung his arms round his neck. They rolled on the ground together. An instant afterwards Zambo arose, looked at the prostrate man, and then, waving his hand joyously to us, came running in our direction. The white figure lay motionless in the middle of the great plain. Our two traitors had been destroyed, but the mischief that they had done lived after them. By no possible means could we get back to the pinnacle. We had been natives of the world, now we were natives of the plateau. The two things were separate and apart. There was the plain which led to the canoes. Yonder, beyond the violet hazy horizon, was the stream which led back to civilization. But the link between was missing. No human ingenuity could suggest a means of bridging the chasm which yawned between ourselves and our past lives. One instant had altered the whole conditions of our existence. It was at such a moment that I learned the stuff of which my three comrades were composed. They were grave, it is true, and thoughtful, but of an invincible serenity. For the moment we could only sit among the bushes in patience and wait the coming of Zambo. Presently his honest black face topped the rocks, and his Herculean figure emerged upon the top of the pinnacle. "'What I do now?' he cried. "'You tell me I do it.' It was a question which it was easier to ask than to answer. One thing only was clear. He was our one trusty link with the outside world. On no account must he leave us. "'No, no,' he cried. "'I not leave you.' Whatever come, you always find me here. 
but no able keep Indians. Already they say too much Kurapuri live in this place. They go home. Now you leave them, me no able to keep them. It was a fact that our Indians had shown in many ways of late that they were weary of their journey and anxious to return. We realized that Zambo spoke the truth, and that it would be impossible for him to keep them. "'Make them wait till tomorrow, Zambo,' I shouted. "'Then I can send letter back by them.' "'Very good, sir. I promise they wait till tomorrow," said the negro. "'But what I do for you now?' There was plenty for him to do, and admirably the faithful fellow did it. First of all, under our directions, he undid the rope from the tree stump and threw one end of it across to us. It was not thicker than a clothesline, but it was of great strength, and though we could not make a bridge of it, we might well find it invaluable if we had any climbing to do. He then fastened his end of the rope to the package of supplies which had been carried up, and we were able to drag it across. This gave us the means of life for at least a week, even if we found nothing else. Finally he descended and carried up two other packets of mixed goods, a box of ammunition and a number of other things, all of which we got across by throwing our rope to him and hauling it back. It was evening when he at last climbed down, with a final assurance that he would keep the Indians till next morning. And so it is that I have spent nearly the whole of this our first night upon the plateau, writing up our experiences by the light of a single candle lantern. We supped and camped at the very edge of the cliff, quenching our thirst with two bottles of Apollinaris, which were in one of the cases. It is vital to us to find water, but I think even Lord John himself had had adventures enough for one day, and none of us felt inclined to make the first push into the unknown we forbore to light a fire or to make any unnecessary sound. Tomorrow, or today rather, for it is already dawn as I write, we shall make our first venture into the strange land. When I shall be able to write again, or if I shall ever write again, I know not. Meanwhile I can see that the Indians are still in their place, and I am sure that the faithful Zambo will be here presently to get my letter. I only trust that it will come to hand." P.S. The more I think, the more desperate does our position seem. I see no possible hope of our return. If there were a high tree near the edge of the plateau, we might drop a return bridge across, but there is none within fifty yards. Our united strength could not carry a trunk which would serve our purpose. The rope, of course, is far too short that we could descend by it. No, our position is hopeless. Hopeless! End of chapter.